Good afternoon, and welcome to the Help Desk and Beyond, Keys to Creating a Service-Obsessed Culture, a Health System CIO Media Inc. production sponsored by Team Dynamics. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Health System CIO, and I will be your moderator today. We have some fun interactive features that we're going to have in our program today. One is called Agree or Over the Top. We turn that into a little poll, so we'll give you a chance to participate. Uh, that panel will automatically open when we're ready to go with that. And uh, questions and comments we encourage. Send them in at any time in the Q&A box. Leave the default set to all panelists, and we will take those later in the program. And you could download the deck by using the URL on your screen, um, and it's also going to be sent out in the chat box, and it's at the bottom of a number of our slides, so plenty of ways to get engaged and involved. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, first we're going to have our panel discussion featuring Mike Martz, SVP and CIO with Mount Nittany Health, Ray Hall, Technology Manager with Covenant Healthcare, and Andrew Graff, Chief Strategist and Co-Founder at Team Dynamics. So without any further delay, we are going to jump right into our conversation. Can you give us an overview of your organization and role? Mike, can we start with you? Sure. Can you hear me? Uh, you will sound great. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So I, I am the, the CIO uh, for Mountain Nittany Health here in State College, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm a Senior Vice President member of the executive team, which means... I don't actually do the direct support, and, and so I make this stuff up. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I'm responsible for, for information services and also responsible for medical records here in the organization. And w while I joke about not directly managing the service team, that, that's both good and bad for me as a, as a role. Um, good because I spend a lot of time talking to the customers of the IS support teams, and so I do hear um, outside of the, the normal you know, process of actually doing the support. I get to hear how people feel that we've done and and um, get some good feedback that way. The bad side is, of course, I, I'm not directly plugged into all the blocking and tackling that happens hour to hour, day to day. So um, I'm not going to be as knowledgeable on some things as, as Raymond, for example. Okay, no worries. Looking forward to uh, the talk. Uh, Raymond? Hi, I, I'm uh, Ray Hall, and I... Uh... I'm the technical manager at Covenant Healthcare. Um, uh, I manage uh, the, all the technology from the mouse on the desktop to the uh, sand in the data center and everything in between. Uh, telecom falls under me. Um, I've got two uh, coordinators, uh, one who is in charge of the desktop team, um, who this directly applies to, and then I have one um, who works with the telecom. Uh, I've been here for about 19 years, and uh, been managing it for about six, and um, so um, we're a epic shop in the Midwest, and we have about 4,500 devices, and we have about 8,000 internal users and 1,000 affiliate users that we provide service to with Epic. Excellent, thank you, Ray. Andrew? Yeah, Andrew Graff. Uh, I work in product strategy and strategy for Team Dynamics, and, and we're a service management service management and project portfolio management platform, and one of the core markets that we serve is healthcare. So we support the IT and, and what we call enterprise service management functions uh, within healthcare systems. Very good. All right, Andrew, thank you for that. Okay, um, let's start off with our discussion. Mike, it's a big general question, but uh, I think maybe it's important, right? Coming up with a definition of, of what it means. So uh, yeah. what's your best definition of great service? Uh, well, when we are quickly meeting the real needs of the caller um, or the, the person who, who has the need so that they can do their job, even and it's even better if we can do that before they call us, if we can mm. proactively address the problem before they even realize they have the problem. Um, that includes having strong customer service skills to, so that we make sure that we actually did address the need, not just provide a solution and close the ticket and wait to see if they complain more. Um, 
Yeah, it's it's making sure that people only have to call or, or you know connect to us once to get things fixed. Uh, that our response is fast. We need to be transparent on where we are with the status of things. Um, we be, we need to be able to manage people's expectations. Very often, people will ask for things on very unrealistic deadlines. They may ask for un, uh, very unrealistic things, and uh, we need to be we need to be able to manage their expectations accurately, so that um, we can then meet them. And I guess the last thing I'd add is it's very easy in a support role to manage the symptoms that you're presented with. Um, sometimes we need to step back and ask more questions about what the real underlying problem is and perhaps give them a different solution than they're asking for, but one that actually fixes the root, the root issue that they've got. Very good. Uh, I actually want to hear also from our, our other panelists on this um... Andrew, your thoughts around great service. You're always, I'm sure you're trying to give your customers great service. So what's what's your thoughts on uh, the definition there? Sure, and I, I agree with everything that, that Mike said. I think that, you know, from our perspective, customers want answers quickly. They want the answers to be accurate, and they want the experience to be pleasant. And so... I think that now great service isn't just having incredibly well-trained service technicians, but it also includes having a great self-service experience so that if someone has a question, they can simply search Google and try to find an answer for that, right? They can visit a portal. If a resolution to a request can be automated, it is, so they get quick, quick response. And then communication. So I, I, think, I think those are the keys. And again, obviously, I agree with everything that, that, that Mike said. And one thing I think that's important, too, is articulating, articulating the services in a way that makes a lot of sense to the customer. I think all of us in IT, we speak IT lingua, lingo so fluently that sometimes it's hard for us to translate what we offer into something that makes sense to a patient or a doc or a nurse or an administrator. So I think also providing great services is, is making sure that what we do is very, very clearly stated in terms that are easy for our customers to, to identify. Excellent. Ray, your thoughts around great service? You're trying to give it to your users. What what is you what are you trying to do? What are your thoughts there? So so my take on it, you know, I'm an operational manager uh, perspective and for me it's drive to the solution you know get to get to the solution don't don't empower empower people so that they can make the call on if they need to replace something or um, if they need to contact the vendor um, make sure that you've got a PO ready for them if they need to get a repair done or something um, and just make sure that they have the tools that they need to be able to drive to the solution and not just push it to the next person or push it to somebody else, but to make sure that they have ownership on things and that they're taking ownership and they're trying to see it through all the way. That's That, that to me is really uh, the key to good service and to really driving these things. Um, uh, and, you know, we'll get into it more on the tool side of things, on things that we've observed, but we find that um, the first person who touches that ticket, if they can solve it, there's a pretty good chance uh, it's going to get solved quickly versus um, if they can't solve it, that ticket has a chance to go into limbo. You know what I'm saying? So that's what we're always trying to avoid. So, Ray, sounds like a big theme here of empowering the people that are actually receiving the issue, the frontline people, empowering them and not micromanaging them and making them do seven things in order to get the solution affected. Yeah, I mean, you you run into situations where, um, you know, for our environment, we replace oldest laptops, oldest desktops first, right? But you may run into a situation where, you know, re-imaging that PC or re-imaging that laptop is just not the right play that people need to be okay with being able to make the call on you know, upgrading that to a newer version of hardware if needed. They don't need to call me and do a thumbs up, thumbs down 4,000 times in our environment <laughs> to get things done. And when people take ownership, as long as they're taking ownership of it and they're trying to do their best, I will, you know, I'll support them. And um, same thing, like we, we have a big VDI virtual desktop initiative right now where we're doing Windows 7 upgrades, as I'm sure many people are. And, you know, 
when we go into an area, it's up to the desktop team to kind of sell that VDI solution. And they don't need me calling up the manager to sell it. They need to like be empowered and say, hey, you know what? I've seen this VDI work at the other part of the hospital. I think it can work in here. Let me show you how this goes. And that's that's really what I need from my pers- from from my perspective. Excellent. All right. Next question. How do you measure service satisfaction? Mike, let's start with you. Oh, um, various ways that I think everybody usually looks at things like ticket metrics, you know, how many tickets do you have open? How fast are you closing them? Um, those sorts of things. We also, and I think a lot of organizations use this, um, use help desk surveys that, that uh, the users have the ability to, to fill out when a ticket is closed. Those are somewhat useful. Um, what I'm finding more useful though is, is um, kind of a step back from the actual transaction itself. Uh, one of the things that we've implemented this year in our, in our organization is um, user satisfaction surveys across a lot of our support teams. So, IS is doing this, but also uh, HR and facilities and security and a bunch of other, you know, teams that don't directly touch the patient um, are are doing these surveys four times a year. We ask a range of questions, but the the key overall question that we're paying attention to is uh, basically overall, how do you feel about your experience with IS over the last 90 days? And so we are doing these, we just did the first of those surveys a couple months ago, and we're doing one each quarter. Uh, we're getting average scores on that particular question for each of the support teams. And we're setting goals to uh, get those average scores up by the end of the year, by the time we do the fourth quarter survey, to, to see if we can improve the satisfaction on each of these, um, you know, each of these support teams. And part of these surveys let people enter in a bunch of comments about how they feel about each of them. And uh, at least for the first round that we've done, I think each of the support teams, including IS, really got some interesting feedback that you don't see when when you're just responding to a survey in a particular ticket. Uh, it tends to be a little bit higher level, a little more thoughtful about IS in general as opposed to just feedback on the, on the issue at hand at the moment. The other thing that I really uh, rely on, frankly, is informal feedback. When I'm in meetings with our physicians, uh, you know, the, the leadership all around the organization, even sometimes through our board of directors, surprisingly, I hear a lot of good feedback, pro and con, about how we're doing, where we can do better. And that often tends to be some of the most valuable uh, information that I have to give me a sense for how well we are doing satisfying the needs of the organization. Excellent. Uh, Andrew, thoughts? Sure, and so I'll, I'll just build upon some of the things that, that Mike Mike has said. Obviously, you have your, your surveys. I, the trick there from what we've seen is distilling down, distilling it down to, if you can, a single question That's that will accurately represent a user's experience. And it's kind of interesting, you, you have Net Promoter Score and some others, but you know, I, I think some other industries, we can turn to some other industries to look for great ideas. I'll give you an example. Uh, Delta Airlines, I think, does a great job with this. And what they ask at the end of an end of a interaction is, if you owned a call center company, would you, how likely would you be to hire the representative who helped you? Right, and it gives some opportunity for feedback, right? But mm-hmm. that tells you a lot. That says, did I have a good experience? If, if, this, if this person was going to be on, would I bring this person onto my team if my role was to serve others? And so I think, and then that's just one example, but I think it's a little bit, it provides a little different way of thinking about things, and it helps the, the person who's received the service think about it in different terms. So I think that's important. Also, we look to immediate feedback on knowledge content. So knowledge-based articles, you know, was this helpful? A lot of times you'll get snap feedback that people won't, won't provide because if you ask for the survey, most people say, you know what, I'm busy, I'll get to that, or yeah. they just delete it. The other thing that we're seeing to be powerful is monitoring the department's social media presence because if you're going to find dissatisfaction, a lot of people can be, as we all know, fairly snarky on 
social media. So if your IT group has a Facebook page or Twitter feed, monitoring that, and just getting a feel for what people are saying out there can be can be helpful too. So I think I, those are a couple things I'd add. Very good. All right, thanks. Ray, you want to talk about uh, some metrics? I know you had mentioned uh, when we talked earlier that you look at call abandonment rate and total active tickets and customer satisfaction score. Want to talk about that stuff a little bit? Yeah. Um, so one of the first things that I keep track of um, when I started as a manager was um, just number of open tickets because I started to realize that there was a definite correlation once we got – above X number of open tickets that the other managers were calling me up. And that was back, you know, three or four years ago when I started, um, you know, this position. And so our first goal was always to track open tickets and keep that count down. If we keep our open tickets for our size down around 100, um, tickets aren't getting lost or forgotten. They're, they're, they're staying on track. Um, the next piece that we keep an eye on, and this has been a really valuable metric, has been um, our call abandonment rate. Um, when that goes up, our ticket count goes up. And our team really responded. Once we, got, once we figured out a way to track call abandonment and we started posting it in the uh, service desk area, the team got a little bit competitive and they got interested in that statistic. And um, our, our Call abandonment rate right now is seeing at 6.6%, and our goal is 8%. Now, yesterday, our call abandonment rate spiked, and our number of open tickets also spiked yesterday. And it's mainly because uh, we had a couple uh, PTO, and we have uh, Windows 7 upgrades going on. So we're kind of stretched thin right now because of the, the Windows 7 issue. But then, like, our guiding star is kind of um, our our – you know, just our standard survey. And, you know, surveys tend to get primary voters, right? They either feel very strongly or they feel very <laughs> negatively about you. You don't get anyone in between, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, what we found is we get about 25% return on our survey, and our survey is very simple. Do you like us or do you not like us? And if you didn't like us or like us, why? And the other thing we do, and we just started this about a month ago, is when we close a ticket, um, our closed messages is, hey, we closed this ticket, but if you have any issues, here's a phone number of someone you can call and get a hold of if, um, if uh, you're not happy with things. And at first, that guy, my coordinator, thought he was going to get swamped with calls, but it wasn't too bad. That really acts as a nice release valve so that people can get, like, they, can, they know who to escalate their ticket to if they had a problem. And it's a lot less frustration if they know who to go to, to to get it. And that has actually helped improve our customer service scores by like three or four percent because we were at around 90 percent. Now we're sitting at 96. And it's really because we're getting rid of those um, really negative primary voters because we're giving them an outlet to get a hold of us faster. So that, that, that in a nutshell is kind of what I'm keeping an eye on. Excellent, excellent. Uh, just to <coughs> a follow-up, follow Ray, um, what do you do to try and keep the call abandonment rate down? And um, in, terms so we, customer, in terms of your customer, uh, just uh, two questions there. So call abandonment rate down and getting a good, accurate customer satisfaction score. How do you make sure you're getting a good score It's accurate? Well, first of all, for the, the score, we make the survey as simple as possible to encourage mm -hmm. people to take it because nobody wants to take a 15-page no. survey, no. you know. Um, so we keep it really simple. So we try to do that. We do bug end users, and um, the system will send out a couple requests for them to participate in the survey. But everyone knows that can be kind of tough sometimes. The call abandonment rate um, – We've got our team split into two groups. So we have one, one group of desktop um, employees, and we split them up into groups. And we have a primarily physical team, and we've got what we call a virtual team. The virtual team is mainly answering the phone, and they're solving the problem as the call comes in. Now, when we run into situations where the call abandonment rate starts climbing, sometimes we'll pull people, like, because, you know, technology is wonderful, we can have our... Um, physical team pick up from their office and join the 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 call the the service the virtual team if we need to on the fly and they can start taking calls but that we we've kind of broken it out and we kind of have a pretty good idea of how many people we need manning the phones to keep that call abandonment rate down and we've been really really successful and a lot of it is just 
we got a status board up in the service desk area that that shows the call abandonment rate as we're rolling through the day um, and who's available and who's not. Because some of it is just making sure these guys plan lunch right, right? Because if they all book at lunch at noon, your call abandonment rate's going to spike that day. So some of it is just simple coordination and just simple blocking and tackling and making sure that not every that we've got enough people at the phones um, to do it. The other thing we do too um, is we do a change review every Friday and on our status board we put up there, here's all the major changes that are going in next week and what dates and times are going in, just so they have an expectation if something goes south of of when when they should be on alert um, for for crazy tick crazy ticket flow, you know what I'm saying? Excellent, excellent information. Thank you. Uh, next question, Mike. Let's start with you. Does service have different definitions depending on who you are measuring? You've got all different types of t people you're trying to serve in a hospital, uh, and perhaps you need different. You need to ask different things of different people. Different things will matter to different people. You've got physicians. Uh, depending on your organization and how it's set up, you could have doctors that are employed, also independent credential doctors that are not employees. You've got nurses, you've got your patients, you've got your patients' families. You want to survey everybody. Um, so what are your thoughts around sort of tailoring things in order to find out what different constituencies are feeling? Oh, that's a good good question. Um, I think our, our definition of service would be roughly the same for them all, but we do offer different channels of support for different groups. So uh, for most of our users, we, we have the, the standard help desk very similar to what Ray described in the same kind of tools. For doctors, we do have a special phone number uh, that they can call, and that's a phone that goes straight to the application analyst supporting the EHR that, that can most directly fix the issues that they typically have. And they have the ability to immediately transfer it to the help desk if it's actually a, a technology or issue or something that the analyst can't handle. But um, the, the volume of calls, the percentage of calls going to the docs most typically aligns well with that. Um, for our patients and their families, we actually have a completely separate help desk uh, focused just on serving patients. And so that's, that's dealing with the patient portal, um, video, visits, those sorts of things. Very good. Andrew? Yeah, so I'll share with you some of the things that we just see from the industry. And I think, you know, we see all of, many different, different approaches to this. But overall, a couple things. First, there are certainly, from a knowledge and service standpoint, differences in these communities as to what they should be able to see. So there are certain things that are relevant to docs and internal team members that aren't relevant to patients. So making it easy so that people don't have a lot of clutter is something that we see our clients wanting to do a lot. So if I'm a patient and I'm on a portal, I see different content than someone else. The other thing as far as how, how service is delivered, we see certainly a VIP track. So, you know, executive, top executives potentially uh, top docs might have a, a VIP way to get in touch with the help desk. But I think more than anything, we're seeing different channels for support based upon the urgency and importance of the nature of the request. Not so much who's requesting, but depending on how critical it is, right? If it's a nurse has a question about uh, something that they see on their, on their shift on the screen in the EHR, that's probably not as important as, as a failure of a piece of equipment that might imp negatively impact the, the care, directly impact the care that, that we're giving. So I think we're seeing differences based upon the urgency and importance more than anything. Very good. Raymond? So we've got internal users at Covenant. Um, they all hit the service desk for the calls. 80% um, of our calls to our service desk are technical related. The uh, EMR uh, tickets will get triaged by the desktop team at the service desk, and then they'll get passed on to the appropriate um, EMR staff based on application. Um, we do have um, external users from Covenant, their affiliate practices, um, critical care hospitals that are on our um, platform as far as electronic medical record goes. Technically, they're a separate business. 
those uh, companies have account representatives that will visit them on a monthly basis and kind of touch base and um, talk through issues with them, um, um, kind of like an account executive almost. Um, so, um, and then internally we've got the standard nurse educators and um, things of that nature. And I know the EMR team will pass training, pass pass things down to the um, to the nurse educators that way. And um, that's kind of like what we're doing. Very good. All right, Mike, let's go to you. This is an interesting one. Do most service encounters happen through the help desk? If so, does that mean a well-functioning help desk is a top CIO priority? Do you think some CIOs don't focus enough on the help desk? Uh, the answers to those three questions would be usually yes and yes, but let me give you some details. Um, so do most service encounters happen through the help desk? Typically, yes. They, they are the, the front door and first contact point for, for most of the calls that we get. Um, but w one of the key things to note is that, you know, uh, depending on what the nature of the issue is, a lot of those calls may get handed off to someone else in IS the second tier, if you will, to, to resolve. And one of the things that we have to watch is to make sure the total time to resolve something is as fast as possible. When, when you're handing things off as, as a ticket that gets passed from one team to another, that can often naturally insert a delay that can really frustrate folks. Mm -hmm. So we try and get users to the person who can fix the problem. As, as fast as possible. We like to focus on warm handoffs, not, not just passing a ticket where we can. That's also why we have that separate number for physicians to use. And, and it doesn't matter, by the way, whether they're employed or independent, we treat all docs the same. But, but that separate number that goes, because most doctors are usually calling about an application question or, or something they don't know how to do. And so we want to get them straight to the people who are most likely to answer the question on that on that very first contact. Um, so is a well-meaning or a well-functioning help desk top priority for CIOs? I would say sure, uh, but frankly, <laughs> because so much of the team beyond the help desk is involved in a lot of these things, the, you need a whole team that is well-functioning, not just the help desk. I, I've seen instances where the the help desks are working really hard to solve everything they can, but if the rest of the IS team behind them is not stepping up, is not taking the tickets, not returning calls quickly, if they don't have the, the same level of service attitude that the help desk usually has, then the whole team tends to look bad and the help desk directly looks bad because they're not getting the support to the, to the customer that they need. So the at least from my standpoint, the CIO needs to focus on, on the, the service levels of the entire team, not just the help desk. Um, and, you know, the, there is a difference between a service desk itself and, and the service desk system or the process that, that the, the desk relies on. There are certainly a number of instances where calls for help will come from, not through the help desk. They may come straight to an application analyst, or they may just come to some IS person who happens to be in a meeting, and they get caught at the end of the meeting with a, hey, I've got, I've got this issue, can you help me with it? Um, one of the things that we drive is that no matter where that call comes in or, or through what path, that we get it logged as a ticket and we track it uh, as a ticket so that we don't drop things, uh, you know, just because they didn't, they didn't come through the, the right path. Yeah, Mike, you're just a little more there. <clears throat> you know, I've been talking to CIOs for a long time, and we don't talk a lot about the help desk. Uh, but <coughs> if if sure. if the help desk, and I believe the help desk is the main entry point, the main face, the main way that users come to know or come to interact with IT, right? That right. makes sense. We agree that, that that's... Most people are having their interaction with IT that way. Uh, not everyone, but most. Um, therefore, to me, it's a little surprising that I don't hear it discussed a lot at the CIO level, and it seems to me that it would be more of a priority. A little more of your thoughts there. Maybe it is. Maybe it is a priority. Maybe I just don't hear it, but go ahead. 
I think it may be. My, my guess is that often when you're talking to CIOs, the discussion tends to be more on strategic um, new things that you're looking forward to working on in the future. And mm -hmm. and these kinds of things tend to be more operational blocking and tackling that, that we have to do really, really well at. But um, they, you're right that they often are not the, the big focus. Um, I think to, to a fair extent, most of us just see it as basic table stakes that we have to be doing well before we move on to anything else. Right. Um, Go ahead. It, there's... Oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Go ahead. No, I'm, uh, I'm just... So I understand, I agree with you. That it, it, should, it, it needs to be done well, but I wonder if it is uh, on, a, on a general basis. Uh, you know, if we had some sort of industry dashboard and to see how everyone was doing, that would be interesting. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I've ahead, never Mike. seen one. It, it's a great question, though. All right. Well, maybe maybe Andrew's got one, or they can make one over there, right, Andrew? <laughs> Industry dashboard? Yeah. Just whip one up for us, right? That's right. Uh, it'll be done by the end of the webinar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Ray, you wanna you wanna uh, Ray, you wanna give me uh, some of your thoughts on the question? Sure. So. Um, I, I I do agree that a lot of the encounters happen through the service desk. I know everyone in IT will always badger and be like, well, you know, if, the, if they just called the service desk, everything would be all right. And yes, I get the occasional call from another director or manager or what have you, but most, most everything is going through them. And they are the face of IT when it comes to fixing their problems. And I, I do think my CIO recognizes it and it's a top priority for him uh, to focus time on. And I wouldn't say so much that he doesn't focus enough time on the help desk, um, service desk area. I think it's more like I would characterize it like it's easy to stretch. You know, it's easy to take them for granted and it's easy to say, well, we got the Windows 7 deployment and we're going to deploy Epic Welcome and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and we're going to do it all by January, right? And it's easy to like stretch them out and forget that um, you've got day-to-day -day tickets. And that's where our like, like I said before, our dashboard of number of open tickets comes from, because mm -hmm. like I gotta I gotta look at that dashboard and I gotta see how hot is it, and if it's getting warm, what's the fire that's causing it to get so darn hot? You know, like like I said yesterday, I noticed a spike in our tickets. We're up we're up uh, 25 tickets and where we normally would be. We're up 25 for the week, and I'm like I call up my coordinator and I'm like, what do you think is causing that uptick? And he's like, eh, uh, you know, he explains this time off in the Windows 7. We're also trying to roll out other things. So I think the real danger is just kind of stretching them too thin and mm -hmm. keeping mm -hmm. keeping an eye on that. Because I do say this a lot, like if you've got the choice between being a builder and a firefighter, the fire always wins. It, it wins every single time. And so you got to make sure that you've got enough people allocated to cover the day-to-day -day fire if you're going to roll something new out. And, you know, like when I'm looking at my staff right now, you know, I, I know the throughput of what my service desk can handle a month, and I know my throughput of what my physical team can handle. And so, like, you know, I need to just, like, make sure that when people are coming to me and saying, hey, we want to do this project, I need to make sure that I don't give the farm away to the project because um, we always have to take care of the fires, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. Great point. Yeah. And I, want, I want to know if Andrew can uh, can comment on those. Um, Andrew, uh, Ray makes a great point that none of this is delivered in a vacuum, so to speak. Um, and one factor that he mentioned was the load on the service desk in terms of what's going on. That's got to be factored into any numbers, right? So if we're looking at numbers on how the help desk is doing, you have to look at what load they're under. And then the other thing that he mentioned is you have to look at the staffing. So you could have a combination of a Windows 7 rollout and a couple people going on vacation, whether or not that was appropriate that they should have been given it at the same time is a different issue. But let's say you're down two people and you're up in terms of load because of things going on. So how do you take that all into consideration when looking at your numbers? How do you, how do you quantify that? How do you put that in a report? Um, Andrew? Sure. Sure. So I think a couple of things to point out that this, this challenge that's being described is one that is commonly addressed through project portfolio management. And so as part of a project charter or planning process, the best organizations are always considering what is it going to need to, what do we need to take this thing live? 
So what kind of resources, who needs to be part of that process? And inevitably, I think that the service organization is often the most overlooked. And this is something rather simple to introduce into the conversation if there's, a, if there's rigor around the project management process or project portfolio management process. So that's, that's one way to do it. The other thing that we see clients doing is managing resources. So, so, you know, figuring out what is our capacity and what's the impact of one of these new implementations or rollouts to be able to essentially illuminate bottlenecks. That's another thing that we see organizations do. And, you know, I'll also make a comment on whether CIOs focus enough on the help desk or, you know, they, you know too, too little, too much. I, I think from our experience, it has everything to do with the pain that the CIO is feeling. Mm -hmm. if, a, if there is something painful, there is a thorn in IT side, and it has to do with the service desk and can be remedied by that, what do you know? Gets more, gets more focus. So, and I'm not saying that's, that's not right or wrong necessarily. I mean, if the organization's humming along and no one seems to be upset or concerned about the, the level of service, I, you know, most CIOs that, that we know would say, well, it ain't broke, not going to fix it. So mm -hmm. I think that's how we see, how we see the focus being applied. Very good. <laughs> I, I, I would just like to add to Go it ahead, too, please. like, you know, one thing I've noticed over the years since, since I am 43 now is that every year I'm either adding two pounds or I'm taking away two pounds. And before you know it, I'm 15 pounds overweight. One thing as we've done our Windows 7 rollout this fall is we're keeping a real close eye on the number of open tickets. And every time that ticks up a little bit, like our normal is 100. And every time we get above 100, I'm like, are we putting weight on here or what? Because we got to be real careful because we want to do as many Windows 7 devices as we can, you know, right now. Um, and, but, um, we also don't want to be putting on a bunch of weight while we're doing it. So like it, it, it's, it's part of just keeping an eye on that dashboard and making sure like in, in a month, I'm not, you know, 250 tickets open, you know what I mean? Um, because we've expelled all our resources. So we're keeping a tight eye on that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. Ray, Ray and Andrew both, both make good points. Um, CIOs definitely do get focused when things go bad because that they do very quickly feel the heat. They're very right about that. But what, one of the other things that um, Andrew brought up that's also important is not overlooking the help desk when changes are happening, when we're rolling out something new. It, I've seen way too many times where an application team will be rolling out something new and forgot to tell the help desk about it. And um, you learn quickly how not to do that. Um, you know, we, we, we have a, a good CIO is, is someone who delegates well to the the support team leaders and is trusting those leaders and, and holding them accountable for making sure that we're doing all the things we need to do. Uh, if that's going well, the, help, the CIO doesn't need to be as directly, personally micromanaging focused on the support desk so that they can, they can deal with the strategic things that, that really is our job. Excellent. And Thank one, you for... one, one, one thing, Anthony, I'd add to to what Ray said, the, the, the beauty of the way Ray is managing his organization is that Ray can point to these trends. I, mean, I, like, the, I like the comparison with adding weight over time because I think a lot of times without these types of metrics, it's, you have a gut feel. But I guess, yeah. I mean, in our experience, a gut feel doesn't often result in an increase in budget or an increase in resources to either add people or fix something with a piece of technology. So the brilliance of what Ray has is that when they get to that point, Ray will have a lot of data to say, hey, this is justified. A solution here is justified. So I think that, that's, that's really, really astute. We, we do have a joke around here. We do, I do ask for the midichlorian count. Like, you got a feeling about that guy? I want the midichlorian count. The nerds in the audience are laughing really hard right now. I, I want to follow up with a question to Mike on that. Now, we know data is important, but Mike, you, you also mentioned earlier uh, about some anecdotal uh, <coughs> evidence. You get some stories that you're told and how those can be extremely valuable. So um, is, it, is it you need both? Um, you know, maybe just the data is a little sterile and, and just the anecdotes, you can't um, interpret a lot from it or draw a lot from it. Your thoughts, Mike? 
Well, you, I find the, the anecdotes help, help validate or, or not the data. Um, I have been in instances where our data looked good, but when I go talk to the users, they have a very different opinion about how we're doing. Uh, and I've been in just the opposite, where, where the two align very closely. So I, I think you need both. Um, the, the more data you have, the more things you can focus on, things like what Ray talked about, about being able to identify correlations between calls coming in and maybe one particular thing, one particular project that you've got going on. Um, those help a lot, but you know, there I've seen instances where IS teams will be closing tickets fast and thinking that that they are being really quick at solving the the users' needs, but then the users log the ticket again because what we did didn't really fix it, and that's a really really frustrating thing for a user. So you you really do need that anecdotal information to back up whether your stats are telling you what you think they are. And I think that's a great point, Mike. Uh, if you create a culture where um, somehow it's all about closing the ticket and that's where the incentives lie or that's where everyone's measured, as you said, they might be closing out tickets faster than they should. Um, yeah. So, Ray, how do you make sure that doesn't happen? How do you make well, sure that's not what's going on? So what we what we preach with the desktop team when they're taking a call is to ask, hey, is this a new or existing issue? Um, because a lot of times if you pick up the phone and say, hey, this is Ray, how can I help you? The end user, they're concerned about getting their issue solved. They're not concerned about telling you the whole story. You know what I mean? Like they're calling you up and they're telling you, hey, I've got a really bad problem. This needs to get fixed. And they may not say that, hey, I've called this ticket in before. So if you ask the question, that helps a lot because um, – you know, it, it gets it gets the it gets everyone looking and getting on the same page. The second thing is is when we do close a ticket out, we do ask in our close statement to say, Hey, if you have to call back on this or if you want to escalate to the coordinator, please reference the ticket number. Um, you know, um I think a lot of times when people call in an issue, they're like, Hey, I'm I'm Ray from three north uh nursing unit they know who i am but they don't realize that there's you know 70 nursing units on, in, in the hospital and it can get kind of hard to sort things out so just encouraging people to call in with the ticket number and to um and for our team to ask for the ticket number to ask for that history is important because again the end user's biggest primary goal is to tell you how bad it is and and why it needs to get fixed, but it's not always, you know, they, they lose track of that stuff, you know, and I would say that as far as when you're looking at data and getting, you know, um, getting, um, you know, informal um, advice, those, that's a great source to build a hypothesis from to go look and see where the processes have failed or where, you, where you've had issues. So, you know, I, I would agree with uh, Mike, Michael that the informal, uh, uh, it, informal interactions that you have with other managers or doctors or end users is, is important also. Excellent. All right. Let me get to some audience questions that have come in. Um, Anthony, I'm interested in how our panel, your panelists are using AI to reduce calls to the service desk and improve the overall customer experience, such as self-service portals, chats, virtual chat agents, orchestration. Mike, you want to take that? Yeah, I, I, I don't want to sound like a Luddite here, but um, <laughs> we, I, I, have, I have seen and made the mistake too many times of trying to implement great technology solutions to help people solve their own problems so that they're not calling us. And the experience way too many times is that people get frustrated by that. Uh, they feel like it's a diversion from someone who can help them solve the problem. And I, I myself have gone through a lot of knowledge bases and dug and dug and dug trying to find the answer and, and really frustrated that I can't quickly put my thumb on it and wish that I had someone that I could just call and ask the question. Um, so I really think we need to be careful about throwing up technology solutions all over the place, thinking that they're going to be great customer support tools but not validating whether that actually helps or not. Um, they can be very useful, and, and we do have our own knowledge base and, and you know, training videos, and, and we do a lot of that. Um, but we 
we are careful about not trying to force users into those first if the users feel like that's not going to solve the need. We want to make sure that we solve the problem first as fast as we can. So AI, for example, um, to me is still a questionable thing as to whether it can be effective enough that, that it can get pers it, it, if it can get users to solutions faster than a real human being. All right, very good. Um, next audience question. You spoke to the concept of everyone and not just the service center needing to align for exceptional customer service. How is that culture created? Ray, you want to take a stab at that? You know, I, I, I really think culture is created by just, I don't know, the interview process. Um, you know, when we're interviewing people, um, we're looking for, you know, technical abilities, but then also looking for indications that these people are, these folks are going to be um, good team members um, and that they're going to take accountability for issues. Um, you know, um, there's nothing harder than when somebody sees something going on that's outside of their scope of duties and just lets the problem linger when they could help point in the right direction or, um, you know, help assist it along. Um, so, you know, we, we ask a lot of character questions in our interview process. We sometimes will ram someone through um, several interviews. We feel like as candidates um, interview, um, you know, the first interview they're really, you know, buttoned up tight, but then as you interview them by like the third or fourth interview, they kind of loosen up. You see more of their personality. You kind of see the, see see those things in them. It's tough interviewing people. I mean, um, uh, I will say I have an identical twin brother, and he was turned down for a position that I got that I got six months later, and we're almost exactly the same dude. It just it, <laughs> it, it is hard sometimes getting that right combination. So. All right, very good. Uh, Mike, uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, I, I agree with everything that, that Ray said there. One other thing that I'd add is uh, with, with the current team, regardless of where they currently are in their life, getting them to be um, respectful and engaged with each other to solve common problems is important. So, it, for example, in a lot of IS organizations, the help desk often is kind of viewed at kind of the lowest rung. It's, it's the entry level into IS, and as people – move up into higher levels into the engineering teams, into the application support teams. Um, sometimes they kind of look down their nose at, at the help desk folks and may not listen to the help desk folks. So um, one thing that I've found can be very helpful is in a formal team-wide setting to have the, the help desk people put together an analysis and kind of a rating of how well the rest of the organization is doing in supporting the customer. Um, that really levels the playing field and it gets the rest of the organization to listen to what the, what the support team is seeing and, and gets them engaged in helping avoid some of the problems that keep generating all these calls so that we can head them off and prevent them from even happening. Very good. Andrew, let me bring you in here. Um, any thoughts on classic help desk mistakes? You've got uh, customers of healthcare and other industries. Uh, what are some lessons learned there that you see across the board? Sure, uh, you know, I think the lessons can be can be numerous, but a couple a couple surefire surefire things that that we've seen that cause strife. The the first is the the dreaded general. So giving users the ability to say, I have something, a general category that I'm gonna submit something into. You know, it's easy, I think, at first, but we see often that that general queue, if there aren't lots of other services out there to help people figure out what they're really, how to articulate what they're asking for, becomes a, a quagmire. Dead-end routings. So, you know, as, as people are going in and planning the escalation paths and a automating things, really testing to make sure that there is no dead end so that, that a request can't get lost because nothing upsets a customer more than their request just getting lost somehow or out there out there in the ethers just waiting to be found in uh, six months or eight months, however long it would take. And then also I think too, there's a, there's a 
there's a tendency to get so busy with fighting the fires, as Ray mentioned, to under-communicate with requesters. You know, requesters want to know where their, where their requests stand, even if it's a simple automated update as that request is processing through a system to say, hey, we are working on this. They just want to know. Mm -hmm. And I think that, 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 that as technical people, it's often our inclination to focus on the technology. The service desk is a really unique IT person who has the willingness and desire and gets energy from serving, plus they have technical chops. So I think actually from a staffing standpoint to find A-plus players who will, who will do a great job for the organization, the service desk is really, really challenging to find those communicators. So those are just a handful of things amongst a myriad of others, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Those are great points, Andrew, and I think uh, there's a, we could do a whole other webinar about staffing the help desk because you can imagine these are talented people you need that have a unique combination of skills, yet it is somewhat of an entry-level spot, uh, and so they move up and out. So how do you keep it staffed with talented people? Mm -hmm. right? So, But let's hold on. I want to get to uh, two more audience questions, and we're running out of time. Uh, first question, Mike, let's go to you first on this. How do you keep from being your own worst enemy by solving things faster than expectations, thus creating unrealistic expectations? So maybe the idea is you had a good stretch, uh, but it's unsustainable. You know, like a salesperson having a great quarter, they're, they're forever doomed to uh, new quotas. You know, Alan asked a qu or Adam asked a question there that, that is a stake in my heart because I'm so guilty of solving any business problem with a SharePoint solution. Um, it, it, is, it is important to sit back and understand what the real issue is. Sometimes uh, customers will come to you with, with a need in mind or a solution in mind that they want, and you know you could throw it in place really fast, but it may not really be the, the problem that they that needs solved. Um, it can be hard to stop and um, go back with them and talk through the bigger picture. To, to make sure that we're really solving the right thing and not, not just solving um, a symptom. And especially when you're in the service organization at, at the help desk, that, that can often be the case. So <clears throat> when I talked before about the trying to build the teamwork between the service desk and the rest of the team, that's where that teamwork really comes into play because the more heads you get involved, the more um, you may be able to spot some bigger opportunities or some different ways of doing things that cause you not to go down that, that trap that, that uh, Adam was alluding to. Ray? You know, I think expectations are really tough with, um, with end users. Um, you know, anytime you get into a situation where the other person that you're dealing with oversimplifies what you're doing, it could be you going to the doctor and being like, hey, I got this tennis elbow, why can't you fix this with a pill? Um, instead of, you know, uh, 12 weeks of physical therapy, they're looking at us like, why can't you just fix this faster? This, is a, this seems like such an easy problem. And it's, I think the challenge with IT is just that, um, you know, end users come to the game, um, you know, with, you know, their, their phone or whatever expertise they have, and a lot of things get solved relatively easily. So, you know, for us, um, for our clinical areas, simplifying the environment by virtualizing every clinical PC has helped us meet user expectations because now um, they're getting a fresh desktop every single day, things of that nature. So as we move forward with our Windows 7 upgrade, we're virtualizing as much as we can, and we're trying to take the complexity out of the system so that we can meet those expectations. Excellent. All right, one more audience question I want to get to. Um, Mike, let me start with you. Some organizations have deeply implemented IDLE. Can you speak to whether or not that is something your organization has done? And if so, has it really resulted in happier customers? We have not implemented it here. Um, I've attempted to implement it in other organizations. And frankly, I've had mixed results. Mm -hmm. um, the, the concepts of ITIL are great. Uh, my observation is it, it tends to introduce rigidity into an IS team that sometimes can become more of a problem than a solution. Uh, and just just a quick example, 
I don't know if this is a good one, but uh, with, you know, with ITIL, you really try and focus on your processes and making sure that everything works exactly the way you want. And for things like people calling in for help, the, the ticket kind of mechanism usually works pretty well for that. Uh, but we recently discovered when, when we did a, a go live of our new um, ambulatory EHRs uh, that we, we wound up using a group chat solution for the, for the direct at the elbow support folks connecting back to the analysts and connecting to each other to solve problems while they were at the elbow during the go lives. And that turned out to be a fabulous way to provide really fast, really accurate support to the end users. It, um, it meant that most of the support effort did not go through our ticket system, uh, but it also meant that most of our support effort was delivered often in seconds or one or two minutes, as opposed to the, the typical ticket response process that, that might take minutes or hours or, or even days. Uh, it made for a dramatically successful go live. And my, my point here is that um, you need to constantly be looking for new, better ways to do things. And sometimes ITIL creates such a focus on following the rules and structures that you've got that it, it may kind of limit your visibility and your creativity for looking for new ways to, to do things better. Interesting points. Ray? So we've kicked the tires on ITIL, and um, we've got – I've got one guy that did a certification. I've got a couple guys that are really process orientated. Um, you know, the the challenge I'm sure many of you are facing, like me, is upgrading to Windows 7. And you know, we're getting close to being done here. But part of the process of that is, is um, you know, I've stolen staff from the network operations center, and I've said, okay, you guys have to go out and help help um, do Windows 7 upgrades. And I've stolen a system administrator who's really great at driving things. And I said, can you help the desktop team do this? And so like, I would say my goal is, is hey, set an objective and get it done. And we, you know, I'm getting my guys, some of my guys are chewing on me a little bit about um, the not being, not being fully staffed and about tickets kind of piling up there in the process not being followed. But at the end of the day, um, I would much rather deal with those issues than get a, get ransomware in, uh, in February or March of next year. I'm planning on being on spring break in March, so I don't want any issues. So that's my real driver to getting rid of Windows 7. Hey, we all have to have our motivations. Uh, Andrew, let me give you uh, the last word. Your thoughts around idle, its value, uh, uh, whether you've seen much in healthcare or other industries. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, first of all, I'll, I'll, I'll make a statement that I have never once seen an organization that implemented ITIL. Wow. ITIL is a library. So people are implementing pieces of it. Okay. Okay. And I think the critical part there is to focus on the problems. You know, what we've seen the best organizations when they approach ITIL, and I agree with, I agree with, with Mike that it, it can be, it can cause a problem too. If, we're, if we go overboard with following ITIL processes, it, it, that can happen. But what I will say is that if we apply the, the institutions that apply ITIL to solve pronounced problems, Right, and disregard the rest of the parts of the library that aren't relevant. Those is where that's where we see the most success. And a specific example is that 80 some percent of technical problems that result in in incidents being reported in North America are caused by IT mistakes. So if that's the case in the organization, the change management process for ITIL is fabulous. It can fix some of those things. Right, so I think it's just being selective. Focus, identify the problems. The best, the best healthcare organizations we work with that focus on the problems, and then they look at the library and say, "Hey, what part of the library could help us fix that?" And let's focus on it. I also think that ITIL gives a great career path for people. That certification is something that's, it's so like you mentioned, help desk people are so hard to find and they're up and out. That ITIL certification and other certifications like Knowledge Center Service give you some more runway where you can give those certifications and help people advance in their careers and keep them maybe a little bit longer. So ho hopefully that was a, I know we're at time, so I'll leave it at that, but there's some observations for you. 
Well, thank you so much, Andrew. And yes, we are at time. In fact, we're quite over time, but I couldn't stop myself. So uh, I think that was a great, great conversation. Um, regarding continuing education, uh, those of you who hold the CHIME CHCIO certification get one CEU for attending our events. So let CHIME know you were here, and if you've asked us to do so, we will. If you need a certificate of attendance for another program, you can use the final slide in this deck. You'll get an email when the on-demand recording of this event is ready to go. If you'd like to sponsor one of our upcoming events or book a custom event, you can contact Nancy Wilcox from our team, and you can go to our website to register for one of our upcoming webinars that are already planned. So with that, I want to thank our panel, Mike Martz, Ray Hall, and Andrew Graff, and I want to thank our sponsor, Team Dynamics, for facilitating or making this conversation happen. Uh, very valuable, I think, to a lot of people. And I want to thank you, our attendees, for joining us again. So with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.